sermon outlines are in back, so if you want to grab a sermon outline, go ahead and grab those. There might be a few up here. We are looking at being free from past regrets, being set free from those things that kind of bind us. In my devotional yesterday on Facebook, I um, had a, a message about Jesus when he raised Lazarus from the dead. It's interesting, once the stone is rolled away, Jesus gives two commands. He gives a command to Lazarus, hey Lazarus, come forth from the tomb. And then he gives a command to all of Lazarus' friends. He says, hey, um, once you guys help him take off the grave clothes, those garments that were binding him, and let him be free. I think those grave clothes, those clothes kind of remind us that at times in life we are bound by what has happened to us in the past. That they restrict us, they confine us, they hold us prisoner. And Jesus said to all of Lazarus' friends, hey, go help him. Help him be free from that which is enslaving him. When you consider your past, what comes to mind? When you think about your past, your past life, what comes to mind? I think for many of us, we think about good times. We think about times with family, with friends. And then also for many of us, when we think about our past, we think of missed opportunities. We think of, of falling and failures that we've had. We think, we think of pain. That's a part of our lives. The world says to us, don't look back. Don't look back. Just go forward. And that's, a, that's an easy motto for the world to say, but we know that we can't just go forward. That we do look back. That defines who we are, and it, it makes us a part of our whole personality. Our past impacts us. But we don't like looking back sometimes. Today I want us to look back, but I want us to look back with Jesus right by our sides. I want us to consider our past, but I want to consider it through what Jesus would have to say to us so that we can move forward. In John chapter 8, the, the gospel re- lesson that I read to you about that woman who was caught in adultery, it's interesting we don't see anything about that guy. Um, there was two that were there. Um, But that's another sermon for another day. But when you look at this woman who was caught in the act of adultery, I think we could say she was having a pretty bad day that day. So some people break into her home, drag her away as, as they're in this compromised position. And they drag her to the temple courts. They drag her to the holiest place in the city where Jesus, this new rabbi, is at. And if she was fortunate, she grabbed the sheet on her way out and used that to cover herself. And then those religious leaders all know what the law of Moses said, that if anyone, not just a woman, it's interesting how they misquote it, but if someone is caught in the act of adultery, that that was a, that was a serious crime, that was a serious breaking of God's law, And they know what the consequence was. You would be stoned. And so they pick up the stones, they gather around this woman, and they're about to hand out justice. And Jesus kind of looks at them and says, okay, if you guys want to live underneath the law, if you want to live by the law, he who is without sin, let them be the first one to throw the stone. And I wonder if Jesus would have said, do I need to say more about this? The amazing thing about Jesus is hey, he's got incredible authority. He's got incredible authority. Because that, he, he, he kneels down, and then one by one, just with Jesus proclaiming that, as he's kneeling down, they start dropping the stones one by one and going back to their homes. And when it's perfectly silent, Verse 10 appears in our sermon outline. Jesus straightened up in the silence and asked the woman, Woman, where are they? 
Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. It's interesting what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say, it's no big deal, don't worry about it. He doesn't say, who cares about what you're doing in your private life? He doesn't say that. He, he, he says, in so many words, this is serious. And because it's so serious, you need my grace, my daughter. Your past actions could have had you condemned. But I will give you grace. What is in your past? As you think about your past, what is there in your past? Is there the, the brokenness? Is there embarrassment? Is there suffering? And is there shame? Jesus says, will you take my grace? Will you receive my grace like that woman did and go and leave your life of sin? It's interesting, Jesus doesn't say there's going to be no more consequences for you. He, he doesn't do a Jedi mind trick and, and make them forget what they saw that morning when they dragged her out of the bedroom. He offers her something more precious, though. I don't condemn you. You're forgiven. You're free from the pain of the past. See, we can go into the future with new life. And that's what he offers this woman. She sinned. The man who was with her sinned. And the guys who dragged her trying to trap Jesus sinned. And yet, he, Jesus says to this woman, you can have a new life. You can have a new start. Today can be a new day. Go and leave your life of sin. Jesus says, I don't condemn you, not because adultery isn't a biggie to God. It is a biggie to God. He doesn't say, I don't condemn you because he's okay with what she's doing. Sexual relations outside of marriage is sinful. He doesn't say, I don't condemn you because it's no big deal. It is. He says, I don't condemn you because Jesus is on his way to Calvary. And as he's going to Calvary, he's collecting all the sins of the world. He's collecting this woman's sin. And he's taking her sin, the punishment she deserved, that stoning, which according to the law was justified. Because the wages of sin is death. He's on his way to Calvary. He's going to the cross. And that's why he can say to this woman, I don't condemn you. I'm on a mission. And that mission is to Calvary. Look what Mark said. In Mark chapter 10, will you read that with me if you've got your sermon outline? This is Jesus speaking. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. And Jesus here is talking about himself. That The him is me. They will condemn me. They will condemn me because of your past. And your past. And my past. My past, Jesus will be condemned for. He's going to Calvary. And he is, he is going to be condemned so that not a single one of us will ever hear those words. He's bearing our sin. Look what Isaiah said. It's interesting. Isaiah, who lived 700 years before Jesus, before the Messiah would show up, Isaiah is, is seeing things. God is revealing to Isaiah what's going to take place through this Messiah at Calvary. 
The Lord says to Isaiah, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. It's interesting, Isaiah is seeing the work of the Messiah who is doing a new thing, who is setting people free from the pain of the past. He's pointing to the picture of Jesus on the cross. So what does the cross say to us? The first thing that the cross says to us, whose past is like grave claws confining us, the first thing that the cross says to us is that you are loved by God. You are loved by God. If your past is dark, if your past is embarrassing... What the cross says to you loud and clearly is that you are loved by God. You are. That God's love for you is stronger than your embarrassment. That God's love for you is greater than the shame. You are loved by God. You're loved by him. Number two, the second thing that the cross says is that he died for everything in your past, your present, and your future. That he died for everything in your past, present, and future. None of us were there 2,000 years ago. You know, I'm starting to feel old, but but I'm not 2,000 years old. None of us were there 2,000 years ago when Jesus hung upon the cross. But every single one of you was known to Jesus that day. He thought of you. He knew you. He loved you. And he endured that cross for you. Everything in your past, everything in your present, and everything in the future, Jesus paid for at Calvary. It, it, what does that mean? Remember there used to be a guy in the New Testament who wrote our theme verse from Galatians chapter 5, 1, and wrote our, our epistle lesson that Mary Beth read to you. His name was Saul. Now, remember Saul? He was the one who would come into churches and drag half of you out of the church and throw you in prison, beat you, torture you. Saul was the guy who would separate families because they worshiped Jesus. And then Saul meets Jesus and becomes Paul. And and can you see Paul showing up in church on the first Sunday? You know, if we think masks were bad... Imagine having Saul in church. Here's Saul, the guy who arrests people, had people killed, and he's in church. Can you see people, like, clearing away from him? But then Paul, this guy whose past was very broken, the people realize that Paul is not the same person he used to be. That Paul is not like Saul. He's not arresting us. He's being beaten for the Christian faith. He's being mocked by those who used to cheer him. And can you see the church kind of saying, that Paul, he's okay now. He's one of us. He's, He's on our team. This Paul who used to fight against Jesus is a changed man. And the same thing goes for each and every one of us. We have been changed by God's amazing grace. The past, the present, and the future has been dealt with. Number three, what does the cross say? We have hope beyond our ability. We have hope beyond our ability. See, salvation is not something you do. You're not getting brownie points for being here today. You realize that? You don't help God out in your salvation. You don't encourage him on. You don't, like, contribute 25% in your salvation. Jesus has done it all. And so, because Jesus has done it all, our salvation is only done by him, we have hope beyond our control. We can't control the past, but he has. And he has control of our lives and our We can have a confidence because our confidence is not in us and how we will handle the the next time that temptation of the past meets us in the future. We can have confidence that when that temptation leaves the past, enters the future, that we can have confidence in him. 
because we have hope beyond our ability. And number four, you can trust God. You can trust God. Some of us have been broken by people in a position of authority or trust. Some of you find it hard to trust a pastor or to trust a parent or to trust a friend. Because in the past, those people you trusted let you down. But I can promise you, the ones who have let you down are the ones who did not and would not offer up their only begotten son for you. They broke you, trust with you. And now you're finding it hard to trust God. But I want to remind you, that the one we trust, the God we trust in, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You can trust him. You might always have a hard time trusting a pastor. But you can trust him. You can trust him. You can trust God. So let go of, three things to let go of. Let go of things you have done against God. Some of you have lied to God. Let me change that. Not not some of you, all of you have lied to God. All of you have mocked God. All of you have rebelled against God. All of us have disobeyed God. We have. And hear this. What does he say? I don't condemn you. I don't condemn you for that. It, it was serious. I was there. I saw it. It grieved my heart greatly when you did that. But I don't condemn you. Because I'm on my way to Calvary for you. Let go of, number two, things you have done against others. Let go of things you have done against others. And I want to just say this. The Christian life is I can... The Christian life is not encapsulated in a motto like, I can do whatever I want. That is not the Christian life. We can't do whatever we want. Sometimes we have to go back and and confess. We have to go to those we have wronged and repent. Sometimes we owe them an apology. And if they're willing to receive it, if they're willing to receive it, maybe we need to give them an explanation. But freedom means the past doesn't bind me any longer. And I can let go of the things that I have done against others. Yeah, maybe at times I go back there and talk to somebody about it. But I can keep walking with Christ. And the third thing, let go of what other people have done to you. Let go of what other people have done to you. Now this is... This is a hard because I don't want to minimize the pain that some of you have experienced in the past. But I do want to say, as God's grace envelops you, as God's grace is for you, as God's grace frees you, will you give others that grace? Will you not hold them captive Will you not keep rubbing their nose at what happened? Will you show them undeserved love? Will you show them grace? I'm not saying the past doesn't hurt. And I'm not saying that the scars aren't still there. But will you give grace to those who have cut you and hurt you? Let go of what others have done to you. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus who can say to that woman caught in adultery, I know the past, and that past is pretty broken. Will you let me carry that brokenness? For I am on a mission to nail the brokenness of this world to a cross at Calvary. Oh, Jesus, thank you for your rich grace that sets us free 
from the pain of this world, from the pain of our past. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.